I did not want to be here. I did not want to talk about this movie because I didn't want to have to rewatch this movie. There is a reason I said I was stopping after the trilogy, but they were hits. So you guys convinced me to keep going. And now I have to talk about it. Hell is real and it's called Transformers The Last Night. Well, we made it. Here we are. I now have to talk about Transformers The Last Night unanimously regarded as the worst film in the franchise for good reason. It is the bad one, it's not a good movie, and um, we're gonna get all sorts of into it in this video. But before we get started, I do want to show you guys a little edit I made in prep for this video. Something that serves as a little celebration and a little thank you note for Michael Bay and this franchise that means so much to me. And also as a little ounce of joy before I talk about the movie. Enjoy. We were once a peaceful race of intelligent mechanical beings. But then came the war between the Autobots who fought for freedom and the Decepticons who dreamt of tyranny. Remember this. You may lose your faith in us but never in yourselves. Transformers The Last Night was the fifth and final Transformers film to be directed by Michael Bay, and this time it is clear that he really did not want to make this movie. In fact, watching the movie, you can tell that it really feels like no one involved really wanted to be here. Gone is the exciting action of the previous films. Gone is the whimsical charm that the other movies had. The style that Michael Bay brought to the first four films isn't felt here. The editing is nauseating, cutting back and forth between aspect ratios. You can tell that Mark Wahlberg would rather be doing literally anything else. Anthony Hopkins is the only actor that seems like he's trying to have some sort of fun in the film. The villains are lame and forgettable, and with the exception of Bumblebee, there really aren't any robots in this film. Optimus Prime and Megatron are barely in it, all the Decepticons are killed in their first scenes, Drift, Crosshairs, Hound, and Grimlock are written out in the first act, Hot Rod shows up but he's just Bumblebee's sidekick and then disappears for part of the movie before showing up again in the third act. The movie is riddled with plot holes, retcons, and continuity errors that only get more annoying and frustrating as the film ages. In fact, most of the complaints that this franchise gets only apply to this movie. And on top of all of that, Paramount decided to go ahead and cut 
40 minutes of the movie out, and it shows. It feels like every single second of this movie was tampered with in some way, shape, or form. It's such a mess, and it's heartbreaking. Michael Bay had no interest in doing this movie. He didn't want to be here. He didn't want to sit there and devote years of his life to awful reviews and people telling him that he's a shitty director who should not be making movies anymore. He was sick of spending years of his life on these projects that he knew people weren't going to like anyway. He wasn't making Transformers The Last Night because he wanted to. He was making Transformers The Last Night because he had to. And the scripts for these movies were never why we went to these movies. That being said, the script for this movie... Let's, let's just talk about the movie. In our final piece of historical revisionism in this franchise, they decided that the Transformers have been here forever. Now if that sounds like it's going to become a massive retcon fest, you would be right. Here's a drinking game. Put on Transformers The Last Night and take a drink every time they retcon something. Within the first half hour of the movie, you will be dead. For example, the opening scene. The opening scene, and I'm being completely serious here, truly is the best scene of the movie. It goes downhill very quickly after that, but the opening is pretty fire. The writers this time around, which is a completely new group of writers, it is the first movie in the franchise that does not feature previous writers on the movie. We have an entire new group of writers, this time consisting of Art Markham, Matt Holloway, and Ken Nolan with a story credit for Akiva Goldsman. I thought he was originally the screenwriter. I guess they bumped him down to just a story credit and had other people write the script. And what you will see is apparently these writers did not do homework because there's no way they watched the first four movies when they wrote this movie. So the writers kick this off with a scene in Dark Ages England where King Arthur is about to go to battle with the Saxons in one of the most instrumental battles ever. King Arthur, not a real person by the way, just a thing worth noting, also not a real person is Merlin, who is going on a side quest to go retrieve the Cybertronian knights who live there for some reason to help them win the battle. And I will say my favorite thing about this is that it made me realize that Michael Bay would excel if you gave him $100 million to make a movie that's entirely set in the Dark Ages. It would go so hard, and I would be there first showtime. So the opening hits us with a metric shitload of information. I mean, we already have King Arthur and Merlin, two completely fictional people, actually existing, and Cybertronian knights who are bestowing a staff upon Merlin to help him win the battle, and we are three minutes into the film. Again, this film was sold on the idea that the Transformers have been here forever, something that Optimus and crew didn't seem to really have much knowledge about when they landed in 2007 looking for Sam Witwicky's glasses. The cracks have already begun to show. But this scene does slap pretty hard. I always thought it was a cool idea that Merlin wasn't actually a wizard, he just had the staff, and because it let him summon Cybertronians, everyone just kind of thought he was a wizard. And he's played by Stanley Tucci, who has no connection to his character in the previous film, and also is one of the greatest actors of all time which makes this scene that much better. Oh, God, I'm sozzled. <sighs> One last nip. But Merlin goes to talk to the knights in what I consider to be the only truly great dialogue exchange in the movie, and he's pleading with them to help and says one of my favorite lines in the entire franchise. I know your world was destroyed. I'm sorry. But please don't let ours die too. At which point the knights give him the staff that history will come to know as the Staff of Merlin. They all combine into this giant metal three-headed dragon named Dragonstorm who looks sick, and they all charge into battle to go help King Arthur win. Now as cool as that sounds, 
we have to remember that according to myth, King Arthur lost the war. Meaning that with a giant Cybertronian indestructible dragon, he still lost to people that only had bows and arrows. In this opening scene, you get to see one of the most talked about issues with this movie. So talked about, in fact, I'm sure you picked up on exactly what it is just off me saying that. And that is the constantly changing aspect ratio. This is the only movie that I like watching on a smaller screen purely because it makes this shit less nauseating. Most filmmakers would pick certain cameras for certain scenes. Christopher Nolan is someone who is really good about this. If you watch any of his movies, Interstellar actually being probably his best example of this, he'll use just a normal format for a lot of the scenes, and then for some of the bigger scenes, like when they're exploring the planet or when they're doing the cornfield chase, he'll switch it up to an IMAX camera so you get a fuller image. Now he sticks with that camera for the entire sequence. In this movie, they had multiple cameras, one of which being an IMAX camera, and instead of figuring out which sequences were gonna be which, they kinda just set the cameras up and started filming. And so almost every shot changes up the aspect ratio. And this goes for normal conversations as well. There are scenes in this movie where Mark Wahlberg and Laura Haddock are talking to each other, and one of them is a full frame, and one of them is like this. And it hurts so much to watch. You will legitimately get a headache watching this movie. But this scene sets up our general conflict for this movie because despite what 99% of the marketing was about, Evil Optimus Prime is like a footnote in this movie. Basically, the staff of Merlin is coded to his DNA, so only one of his descendants can activate it. The movie kind of breaks this rule and they're unclear on what exactly the rule is, but that's what they tell you. And then to cap off this scene, Anthony Hopkins delivers this line. It has been said through the ages, without sacrifice, there can be no victory. And if you're expecting the film to elaborate on how the Witwicky family motto is the motto for a lot more than just the Witwickies, get ready, because the film has absolutely zero intention of ever answering that question. The movie does start to do something cool where after the title card we get to see Optimus Prime floating through space completely frozen, but then you're taken out of it when you realize that he just doesn't have the seed and they're never going to mention the seed in this movie. And this is all kind of happening over Anthony Hopkins giving a monologue that is catching us up on what has happened between Age of Extinction and The Last Night. The movies have always done this, they've always given us that, which is fine, I'm okay with that. The problem is, unlike those other movies, this one does not stop with the constant exposition. Anthony Hopkins is only in this movie to give exposition. Any time he is on screen, he is just monologuing piles upon piles of lore and information that we need to know to understand this movie about robots that beat the shit out of each other. We learn immediately that Optimus Prime is gone and has been gone for some time. Megatron is in hiding. Oh yeah, he's back to being Megatron now. And Transformers have been declared illegal on Earth and there is a military force devoted specifically to hunting them down. Yes, that was the plot of the previous film. Do they care? Not really. Oh yeah, and then in Cuba for some reason, Castro just lets the Transformers run around. This movie came out in summer of 2017. Fidel Castro died in fall of 2016. So Castro was in fact not letting the Transformers just run around Cuba. John Turturro's back, and he, along with Anthony Hopkins, are investigating these six metal horns that have grown out of the earth. And uh, John Turturro spends this entire movie at a phone booth in Cuba, because they clearly just filmed all of his scenes in one day, on the phone with Anthony Hopkins, not contributing 
anything to the plot and in no way mattering for the actual movie. He is so unimportant, in fact, that I'm not going to mention him for the rest of the video. This was one of the main characters of the first three films, by the way. In addition to everything I just said, Cade Yeager is in hiding now, trying to save Transformers that are dying, and they just keep coming to Earth, which is funny as hell, too. Um, and on top of all of that, Cybertron, a planet that we saw incinerated in Dark of the Moon, is much smaller and is now flying to Earth. And if you think this is entirely too much shit to throw at us, I want to let you know that we are only eight and a half minutes into the movie. And this is where I'm going to give my spiel on cutting shit out of movies. Paramount cut 40 minutes out of this movie. It is a two and a half hour movie. It was originally three hours and some change. Now, yeah, that's really long, but the movie needed those 40 minutes. Now, they cut it because Paramount was like, well, if the movie's shorter, we can fit more showtimes in a day, which means that more people can go see the movie. This is really funny in hindsight, considering that Oppenheimer, a three-hour-long R-rated biopic, almost made a billion dollars, and this movie barely broke even. And it's also crazy to think about the fact this came out one year after Warner Brothers famously destroyed Batman v Superman and Suicide Squad in the editing bay and caught flack for that. Now we have Paramount doing the same thing, and they're surprised when they have the same result. And you know what's even crazier about how much info they threw at us? immediately, that so we ain't even seen any of our main characters yet. So let's talk about some of our characters. A group of children sneak into this barricaded off area of Chicago that is restricted due to severe alien activity. And while there, they investigate this crashed ship, and the knight that's inside it is not as dead as they thought, and all this activity alerts a walker drone to the area. This thing is just an ATST. Straight up, like Disney could sue for copyright if they wanted to, and they would win. Because it is insane just how much of this movie is just copying Star Wars. This movie came out a year and a half after Star Wars The Force Awakens and one year after both Batman v Superman and Captain America Civil War. You can probably assume where the BVS and Civil War similarities came from since, again, that was the entirety of the marketing campaign. But this film copy and pastes so much Star Wars stuff because The Force Awakens had become one of the highest grossing films of all, t of all time. Actually, I think it was number three before Infinity War and Endgame came along. So it was a top three film. And so Paramount was like, what do people want to see? And they put it in this movie. The TRF has walkers. They have TIE fighters. Literal TIE bombers are in this movie. How Paramount was not sued for copyright infringement, I couldn't tell ya. One of our human characters in this movie is a lone scavenger who grew up on the streets and is all hardened because of it, who has a cute little robot as a sidekick and gets in touch with the grizzled badass action hero and is just looking for a place to belong. Where have I heard that before? Oh yeah, that's Ray's character to a T. It is the same thing. Isabella and Ray are the same character, except for once I can confidently say I would prefer Ray. But it's not like Isabella does much in the movie anyway. In fact, she's barely in it. The only reason she is in this film at all is to get little girls who were fans of Ray in the theater. 
Immediately after this, we meet the head of the TRF, who orders an orbital strike on this one harmless Autobot who's just trying to protect these children. Now, I want you to remember that they order an orbital strike against a harmless robot, because it's going to be something I bring up later. But what happens immediately after this? Marky Mark and Bumblebee, our actual main characters of the movie, finally show up to save the day. And you know what? Hats off to them for acknowledging that no one liked Bumblebee's design in Age of Extinction because they sent him back to his actual good design that he had in the first three movies and the start of Age of Extinction, which is much better. He is a new Camaro this time, and everything in this movie, for every good thing, there are like 18 bad things, because as cool as it is that Bumblebee is back to looking good again, they had two different Camaros for Bumblebee. Sometimes his doors open to the side, sometimes his doors open up. They didn't even pay attention to which Camaro they were using. That's how little effort was put into this. So they save all the kids, and on their way back, we learn that Cade Yeager's like the most wanted dude on planet Earth. Now, don't worry about really remembering that, because it comes up in certain points in the movie, but to say that it's actually an important thing in the movie, um, would be a stretch. It's more of just a thing that happens so that we can have action sequences every once in a while. But Kate was not actually here to save these children. This is where you really gotta bear with me because this is where stuff gets weird. He was there to save the dying night that those kids found like 37 seconds ago, which he ends up failing. But the knight hands him a Cybertronian talisman that Cade declines, and then after the knight dies, the talisman sprouts legs and follows Cade around. And as if Anthony Hopkins and Cogman don't just say it to you, it is at this point that it becomes clear that the titular last knight is not Optimus Prime, it's not Megatron, it's not one of the actual knights, it's not even Bumblebee, it's not a Cybertronian of any kind, it's Cade Yeager. And here's where things really start to get problematic if they weren't already. We know that the knights exiled themselves to protecting the staff of Merlin to prevent Quintessa from ever getting it. We learn later in the movie that the staff of Merlin is housed at this ship that is buried underwater off the coast of England. This knight is in Chicago. Do you see the problem here? This is also a good time to remind you that we are only 17 minutes into the film. We have met Arthur, Merlin, Isabella, Squeaks, gotten a glimpse of both Anthony Hopkins and Cogman. We've been introduced to a new type of Transformer killers. We have been introduced to a new type of Cybertronian. We've learned that Optimus Prime is gone. Megatron's in hiding. We've gotten a glimpse of Barricade. We've learned that the zombie Cybertron is on the way to Earth. There are horns sticking out of the earth. Cade and Megatron both know something big is happening. John Turturro and Anthony Hopkins are both researching what these horns are. We have been reintroduced to Cade and Bumblebee, who can now just disassemble and reassemble himself at will now. How does it work? I don't know. The movie doesn't show how it happened. The movie doesn't explain how it works. They don't allude to how it works, and they never will. Will. And right after all of this, we are reintroduced to William Lennox. And as much as I would love to praise the fact that they put William Lennox in this movie in an actual supporting role, I can't because for some reason, the guy who was running Black Ops missions with the Optimus Prime is now on the team of people that kill the Transformers. What even is this movie. We are not 20 minutes in and my head already hurts. I was gonna calm down. 
I really was. I was going to take a break. I was going to breathe. I was going to calm down. But immediately after this, we are reintroduced to Megatron. And at least they do something cool where everyone is waiting for voice authentication to confirm that Megatron is the guy whose signal they intercepted. But Lennox picks up on it immediately because the voice still lives in his nightmares. That's cool, I guess. I can hear it in my nightmares. Megatron. Waiting for authentication. It's him. I am going to take a break from complaining to actually praise something. Megatron's design in this film is sick as shit. It might just be his best design. He's back to being a jet. He has these side pieces on his head that fold down to create his battle mask. And they even gave him the giant arm cannon. On top of that, he has this cool sword axe combination. And then because they're doing the thing in this movie where they want Optimus and Megatron to look like knights, Megatron looks like this ancient warrior knight. And when you combine all of these things together, it makes him look like a monster. You might notice that both Megatron and Optimus Prime have red markings down their faces in this movie, meaning that they are both servants of Quintessa. But don't worry, the movie's not going to do anything remotely interesting with that concept. In fact, Optimus and Megatron in this film are only on screen together for about four seconds. Are you guys keeping up with this at all? Because I'm trying to make this easy to comprehend and I can assure you, I have no clue what's going on. 22 minutes into this movie because they haven't already shoved enough bullshit down our throats, we are introduced to the Optimus Prime portion of this film. And Optimus really isn't in this movie much, which is kind of a problem considering he was the only thing they marketed about this movie! My world. What has happened to my world? You were there! You were the one who gave the order! But considering that right after this, Optimus blames both Megatron and Quintessa for the state Cybertron's in, it becomes abundantly clear that the writers of this film did not watch so much as a single second of the previous four films when they were writing this film. And Michael Bay had lost interest to say anything about it. Oh yeah, I briefly mentioned Quintessa, because now, after the movie has introduced about 37 movies worth of information to us, do they decide that it is the perfect time to introduce our main villains of the film, Quintessa and Infernicus. Although you don't really have to worry about Infernicus at all. After all, the movie didn't. <laughs> I'm just going to knock out Optimus Prime's entire story real quick. So Quintessa humbles him up immediately upon his arrival to Cybertron, brands him with the exact same red mark Megatron has, again, don't worry about it, and tasks him with retrieving the staff. Here's the thing, the staff is not just turned off, it is completely cloaked, and Vivian is the only person who can retrieve it. So, as per this movie's own rules, Optimus Prime should not be able to do this mission. And the reason Quintessa needs this staff is because then she can merge Earth and Cybertron into one, restoring Cybertron to its former glory and destroying Earth and Unicron in the process. Because this film has decided that Earth is Unicron. Now, I'm gonna very quickly spoil just a concept from Transformers Prime. Transformers Prime also does the thing where Earth is Unicron. But unlike this movie, they handle it masterfully. So if you want to see a story where Earth is Unicron, just watch Transformers Prime. And I'm aware that the next film that ended up getting cancelled was the one that was really supposed to explore the idea of Earth being Unicron, as Optimus mentions at the very end of the movie. The problem is that his role in this movie is nothing beyond just a couple 
name drops for fan service and a reason to justify their Transformers have been here forever idea. So just like everything else in the movie, they just don't do anything with it. And this is our main plot. And the perfect example of this film just wasting everything is Nemesis Prime. He was the only thing they marketed. He is advertised as the main villain of the movie, but he's little more than a cameo. The Optimus Prime we know and love is brainwashed and gone, and he is just replaced with this evil guy who is effectively a Decepticon. And that is so creative and can lead to so many amazing opportunities and action sequences, but no, he shows up at the tail end of the second act, kills two of the knights that were like a toe stub away from dying anyway, has one encounter with Bumblebee, which is the same one where he ends up snapping out of it, and then he's just a good guy for the entire third act of this film. He really does nothing in this movie. Hell, the defeat on the villain Bumblebee gets, so Optimus doesn't even do that. So in terms of villains, we have Quintessa, Megatron, the TRF, a plethora of Decepticons that are set to be introduced in a couple minutes, as well as Nemesis Prime, and the film does nothing of note with any of them because they were too busy trying to set up a cinematic universe instead of running with what they already had. Let's write a new character down because at the 25 minute mark we are introduced to Vivian Wembley played by Laura Haddock who is the last descendant of Merlin and the main female lead in this film. Yeah, you know that girl that they spent a few minutes introducing us to 15 minutes ago? No, she doesn't matter. She's not crucial to the plot. She's not the main lead of this movie. She doesn't even get to go on the adventure. Makes you wonder why Isabella's even here. In terms of female leads in this franchise, I'm not gonna say that Vivian's the worst. She's at least better than Tessa, but she never stares down a Decepticon and tells them to go screw themselves, so she's no Michaela or Carly. At least the movie makes a point to let you know who this character is. Because every single scene she is in, the movie will go out of its way to tell you that she is single. That is her entire character. That's it. Every single scene in this movie where Laura Haddock is on screen, someone in the movie is mentioning that she is single. You know who else is single? Mark Wahlberg's character. The entire dynamic that the two leads of this movie have is that she is single and he is into her. There you go. Those are our two main characters, ladies and gentlemen. But after we meet Vivian, we gotta go back and check on Cade because God forbid we stay on a character for more than 27 seconds at a time. And Cade Yeager is now living in hiding with the Autobots in a junkyard. And I kind of think this is a cool idea. Drift is there, Crosshairs is there, Bumblebee and Hound were the ones he took on this mission, but the Autobots are super bored because they're just in hiding waiting for something. Wheelie is here also, so his and brain sacrifice now just fully doesn't matter. Screw you. We also meet, you guessed it, a new character named Jimmy who does, you guessed it, absolutely nothing in this film and he's what, like the 17th new character? This shit's pretty funny though. You talk too much. Come on man, million year old legendary war and you act like a bunch of junkyard dogs! Grimlock is also here, and he's just acting like a dumb dog. He's eating cars. Uh, Cade can just yell at him and keeps him domesticated. Cade's raising the baby Dinobots. Grimlock also, weirdly, smaller in this movie. Um, like, remember, he made Optimus look small. In this movie, it looks like he's not that much bigger than Optimus Prime. But remember the ancient warrior robot that Optimus had to best in a fight to the death almost to earn his respect? Yeah, that's not how Grimlock is anymore. He's just some dumb animal. 
he has no reason to be in this movie. Not only were the Dinobots perfectly wrapped up in Age of Extinction, Grimlock also has about 18 seconds of screen time, and he's not even in the third act. In fact, now that I think about it, Cade Yeager doesn't really have a reason to be in this movie either. His story was wrapped up in Age of Extinction. He doesn't need to be here. His arc is kind of undone for the sake of making him an asshole again. I mean, you could have just had Isabella and Vivian as the main people in this movie, and it would have worked perfectly fine. And it sucks because Cade was one of the highlights of Age of Extinction, but is probably my least favorite character in The Last Night. But it's okay, you know why? Because we're introduced to yet another character named Day Trader, played by Steve Buscemi, who is in this one scene and this one scene only. And the function he serves is to just tell the audience random shit. So he shows up with a new voice box for B, which I can promise you comes out of nowhere. Starscream's head and to let the audience know what the talisman is that Cade now has. It is the most awful on the nose exposition ever. And just to dig the knife a little deeper, we are then properly introduced to Isabella, who is on a quest to become the most annoying character in this film. A thing she accomplishes in about 10 seconds. Credit where credit is due, in a movie where everyone is phoning it in, Isabella Merced manages to deliver a solid performance. They just killed the last thing that I call family. I want to stay and I want to fight them. This was her first big movie with her being just 15 years old at the time of release. And it's no wonder that she grew into a pretty successful actress because she's actually delivering a pretty solid performance in this movie. It's just a shame that the material they give her is next level garbage. I was ready to actually get on with the main plot of this movie because I've been trying to play catch up this entire video, but I can't do that yet because the movie still has to introduce another character. This scientist dude who immediately takes the crown away from Isabella as the most annoying character in this movie and lets us know that we are on a three day timetable until Cybertron collides with Earth. This is a movie about robots killing other robots. How is there this much stuff happening? The movie is now going to spend its next two hours rushing to a convoluted conclusion in an attempt to wrap up everything it has been throwing at us because for some reason they decided to combine an entire franchise's worth of films into one movie and then pluck 40 minutes out of it, leading to this absolute dumpster fire that I am now talking about. God damn it. So Megatron wants to talk to the US government because he has some requests. And all of Glenn Morshower's scenes in this movie take place in this dark warehouse, pretty much, where it's just him, a table, and Lennox, and then like just a couple soldiers in the background. Now, the idea of filming in an empty warehouse is a trick that a lot of lower budget films do to hide their budget because you have a lot of capabilities of filming in an empty warehouse um, that doesn't require as much location hassle or as many extras. This movie does it because it's easier and won't take as long to do because no one wants to put any effort in and it is so jarring. I noticed it the first time I watched the movie and it has taken me out of the movie in somehow every viewing I've had of the movie since then. To praise something in this movie, Megatron is at least living up to the name Decepticon because he's playing like every side of the conflict. But you know how I said for everything this movie does right, it does like 18 things wrong? Uh, because Megatron's not the main villain and is just Quintessa's bitch this entire movie, it really makes the fact that he's actually being deceiving that much 
less interesting. And the fact that he and Prime are just on the same mission makes his role redundant as well. Megatron's clearly in this movie because the last movie brought him back. They had no clue what to do with him, though. So Megatron strikes up a deal with the government that if they release certain Decepticons from prison, he will help them find Cade Yeager and the Autobots, which is also just a ploy for him to get the talisman. Remember how I told you to remember that one Autobot who got hit with a literal orbital strike? Yeah, so Autobots who aren't doing anything get gunned down. The Decepticons who are genocidal fascist maniacs that have tried to destroy Earth four times now, go to jail. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know if I can finish it. Really quickly, I want to attempt to fix Megatron in this film because I think, given the story that's being told, he had the most potential as a character. And I'm going to do this by making one change to the first act of the movie. I am going to have the talisman actually be bestowed upon Megatron. Let's make Megatron the main robot and the last knight. If we're doing an evil Optimus Prime, we should do an anti-hero Megatron. Have Megatron betray Quintessa upon gaining that level of power where now all the Cybertronians worship him. There would still be an evil Optimus Prime, but he would be fighting against Megatron because Optimus is still loyal to Quintessa and Megatron isn't. It would make Megatron a larger threat and also give him a larger stake in the story, also completely removing the idea of him just being Quintessa's servant, especially considering his whole thing in the previous two films is that he bows to no one. But why would we watch the previous films in making the fifth installment in a franchise? That's blasphemous! Shout out to this goaded shot. I'm calling out the praises when I see them because they are few and far between. Remember how this film is copying the biggest films from those couple years? Well, they're gonna do it again. And guess which one they have the audacity to plagiarize this time. Let's go save the world. I can't wait to show you my toys. You know how many fantastic blockbusters came out between 2014 and 2017? But when they were trimming down this movie, they looked at Suicide Squad, a movie that is criticized in every aspect, including for what this movie is about to do, and they thought, yep, that's how we're gonna do it. What up, fellas? Man, I wanna kill you right now. This is the worst possible way that you can introduce characters. And it's doubly upsetting that this is how they introduce these characters. Because for the first time in this franchise, the Decepticons have personality. Combine the way they're introduced with the way their story wraps up, and it makes it that much more depressing. Megatron's picks are Mohawk, Dreadbot, Onslaught, and Nitro Zeus. He wants to take Berserker, but the government says no and makes him pick again, at which point he ends up taking Onslaught. It's funny until you remember that Megatron was ready to get violent over them questioning his other picks for the team. So there's no reason why he should now all of a sudden just be okay with them not releasing Berserker. It is funny though. It's pretty funny that he just moves on. I want to remind you guys that this man who has already made an entire planet unlivable is now the bitch to both Quintessa and the United States government. Hell, in the third movie, he and Sentinel Prime blew up Chicago because they thought it'd be fun. Toss Barricade in there, and we have six Decepticons. And I love them. Nitro Zeus is such a treasure. I know where you live, Enrique. Say hello to your wife for me. Besides the fact that the Decepticons in this film do absolutely nothing, 
Their designs are also the result of laziness. Mohawk is the only original design, and coincidentally enough, is also really small and easy to hide in larger group shots. Dreadbot and Berserker are just the dreads from Dark of the Moon. Onslaught is Long Haul from Revenge of the Fallen, and Nitro Zeus is just a slightly modified shockwave. The laziness is made incredibly more obvious by the fight with the Autobots and Decepticons that points out an issue that plagues every single fight in this movie. They are all only a few seconds long. What the fuck? Where is Bumblebee's body? That is the most obvious prop head I've ever seen. It's not even the same shade of yellow as Bumblebee. It's hilarious because this is the only scene in the movie where it feels like the movie actually wants to slow down and have some genuine drama between the characters, but I can't focus on it because I'm seeing a obvious plastic bodiless head sitting between the two actors. At least this part's funny, I guess. This is so exciting. Oh no, this isn't my damn voice. I really wish the escape from the hideout was longer, because I always thought it was cool the way they executed it. Hound decides to provide cover fire and buy them some time along with Grimlock while Cade, B, Crosshairs, and Drift all get out of there. I thought that was always pretty sick. But then you get to see on display just how short the fights in this movie are because Hound rolls in, shoots at Megatron, Megatron shoots back, there's way too many explosions for the amount of times Megatron fired, and Hound is out of the movie. He doesn't show up until the third act. That's the fight. And he's not the only Autobot that falls victim to this because right after this happens, Grimlock bursts up out of the ground and the Triceratops, who you don't see in the junkyard at all, he just kind of materializes, decide to take out some of TRF to buy Cade some more time. And I'm aware that Grimlock shows up in the fight in the ghost town, but he's only there for like three seconds. Other than that, Grimlock is out of this movie. The one difference, though, between him and Hound is that at least Hound shows up again. Grimlock does not come back in the third act. There is no reason for him to be in this movie at all, and he was one of the best parts of the previous one, so thanks a lot. But in the ghost town is where the actual fight goes down. Here's how it goes down. I am going to describe it to you, and it'll take me about as long to describe as the actual fight is. Ready? Cade sets off an explosive device on the Decepticons. Grimlock charges in, knocks Barricade out of the way, eats Dreadbot, Drift and Crosshairs team up to decapitate Onslaught, Megatron at this point orders a retreat, and then Mohawk, upon realizing he was left behind, is looking around for Megatron when Bumblebee Combat rolls in, shoots Mohawk, and Mohawk loses his head and his body blows up. That's the fight. That is the fight between the Autobots and the Decepticons. Megatron, Nitro Zeus, and Barricade survive, but they don't show up until the third act of the movie. The rest of this sequence is devoted to Cade running from the TIE Fighters. I get that it's been a few years since the ending of Age of Extinction and the start of this film, and the Autobots and Cade are a very, very tight unit, but this is ridiculous. These were Megatron's top draft picks, and they go down like they're just background Decepticons. We devoted time in the movie to introducing them and giving them all personalities, and they are all killed immediately. Then again, they were in human captivity, so maybe they weren't that great to begin with. All right, we have reached the point where my will to live is restored. My happiness has returned, and I can hold out just a little longer with this movie. Potentially the greatest character in the Bayverse. We've seen him already, he has said a couple lines, but at 56 minutes and 17 seconds, 
Cogman properly appears. Leprechauns are tiny, green, and Irish, and that is offensive. Oh, oh I am so clumsy! Don't kill the messenger, or the messenger will kill you. I was making the moment more epic. Welcome to Air Folger. Please strap in. Turbulence can kill. There will be no snack service on this flight. No drinks, no fun. God, he is the best. The only bad thing about Cogman is that when he's not saying something that's funny as shit, his dialogue makes it abundantly clear that this film has some of the most cliché dialogue you have ever heard. I am here because of that. And that is here because of you. But Cade goes with Cogman because we need to introduce the shit that happens in the second half of this movie. And that means that every character that we have spent the first 50 minutes getting to know is just out of the movie now. Isabella and Jimmy, gone. Drift, Crosshairs, Hound, Wheelie, and Grimlock, gone. Cade takes Bumblebee with him, but it's just the two of them that go. And I just have one question. How on God's green goddamn earth did Bumblebee fit on that airplane? There's a general rule in film, and that is show don't tell. It is the idea that if you can show your audience something instead of having a character say it, then it would be much more interesting and you would be much better off for it. The makers of this movie clearly missed that memo because this film is a masterclass in tell, don't show. For example, periodically, this film will cut to a room of NASA scientists saying how long it is until Cybertron makes contact with Earth. Oh, did I say a room of scientists? No, I meant an empty room and a close-up shot on a computer screen and a voiceover telling us that we have two days until Cybertron makes contact with Earth. And then they cut to a shot of Cybertron with Earth in the distance and you see just how close it is. Which means at this point, Cybertron should be visible from Earth. Wouldn't it be much cooler to have a character on Earth look up at the skies and realize that it's getting closer? It would! You know how I know it would? Because later in the movie, Isabella does just that, and it is so chilling. So I was watching this movie and taking notes while I was watching it, and right after the scene where they tell you how close Cybertron is to Earth and I finished my blurb on Show Don't Tell versus Tell Don't Show, the very next scene is Optimus chained up and Quintessa straight up telling him that planet Earth is Unicron. The place you call Earth has another name, Unicron. I am hanging by a thread, and someone is holding scissors. At one hour, one minute, and 49 seconds into this movie, Optimus becomes Nemesis Prime. Just felt I would point that out. The film has spent more time setting up the fact that Kate and Vivian are getting together than it has on Nemesis Prime, which I would like to remind you is the only thing the film was marketed on. And I would like to say that once Anthony Hopkins shows up, we get some more good stuff, but no, the best stuff is behind us. Look at how many cuts are in this one simple moment. We have guests. I haven't mentioned the editing too much, but those couple seconds are the perfect example of how the entire film is edited. It is horrendous. Every shot is in a different aspect ratio, and we see it from four different angles, none of which are the desirable one. Not only do we get a proper introduction to Anthony Hopkins, who has so far just been teleporting around the planet, we are also introduced to yet another character. 
This one being Hot Rod. In the original G1 cartoon, Hot Rod goes through this character arc to become Rodimus Prime. In this movie, this dude isn't gonna amount to anything. And when they announced that Hot Rod was gonna be in this movie, they also went ahead and announced that he and Bumblebee were gonna be brothers in arms. We are halfway through the movie. We've got about an hour and 20 minutes left. We're about an hour and 10-ish, 10, 15 minutes in. And they are just now introducing Bumblebee's brother in arms. We have not seen Hot Rod in his robot mode yet. He and B are just now getting to the same place. And he has not been seen or so much as mentioned at any point in the previous four and a half movies. Despite the fact that he and B apparently have this long-standing relationship. And you would never get the hint in the movie that they're brothers in arms, because the only time they're on screen together in the movie is when they're standing next to each other during Optimus Prime speeches, when they are standing next to each other in their vehicle modes, when Hot Rod throws a temper tantrum about his French accent and smacks Bumblebee on the chest, and when he's very briefly next to Bumblebee in the World War II flashback. We didn't, we, like, they couldn't even give us a brief moment of Bumblebee and Hot Rod speaking to each other. They don't speak to each other in this movie. And Bumblebee gets his voice back in this movie. They can do that. We're just supposed to roll with the fact that the two of them have been friends for centuries, probably. He's also French. The movie does go out of its way to point out that no one can understand him, but that doesn't help the fact that I can't fucking understand him. Je m'appelle Hot Rod. At what? Hot Rod. As for Anthony Hopkins, seeing a two-time Academy Award winner deliver some of these lines is something else. Yes, but you want to know, don't you, dude? What a bitchin' car she is. She's barking mad, she's an absolute bitch. He is playing a character named Sir Edmund Burton, who is the 12th Earl of Folgen and the last surviving member of the Order of the Witwickens, a secret society of people that exist to protect the secrecy of Cybertronians. And it truly shows how great of an actor he is that he can make this amount of exposition look good. For every second of his screen time, he is expositing but he makes it cool. All he does in this movie is expose it to people over and over and over, but he makes it look easy. I want to see Cogman again. But I do so very much want to cross his windpipe. We have reached the scene in this movie that I have come to call absolute fucking bullshit. The next three minutes of this movie, and you can time it, manage to retcon and ruin the entirety of the franchise. People always say it is insane how quickly Game of Thrones was able to ruin everything that came before. This has it beat. Again, three minutes. And it makes the entire franchise Virtually unrewatchable because anytime you go back and watch the movies, you have to live with the knowledge that everything Anthony Hopkins is about to mention is canon. Again, in three minutes. First off, we learn that a watch that Anthony Hopkins has in his possession is a transformer that killed. Hitler. So Hitler didn't kill himself, apparently. He also has statues of Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, and Megatron, but it's their forms from Age of Extinction and The Last Night, and these are ancient statues, so he wouldn't have artifacts of them. He then tells us about the Order of the Witwickens. The movie won't tell us how Sam Witwicky is connected to the Order of the Witwickens. I mean, they have the same goddamn name, but it will show us a picture of both Archibald Witwicky and Sam Witwicky, as Anthony Hopkins tells us that he's the last surviving member. So Sam's just dead now. Shia LaBeouf didn't want to come back, so Sam is just dead now. 
And since when was Sam a member? He had no clue who the Cybertronians were when they first showed up. In fact, the Transformers got more public the longer they knew Sam. The Order also consists of every single famous person to ever exist, some of which Anthony Hopkins mentions, some of which I saw in the background pictures in his study, and I definitely missed a couple because I was not familiar with everyone. There are so many historical figures that were members of the Order of Witwickens that I will legitimately be reading the list I wrote up on my computer because I cannot remember them all. Strap in for this shit, folks, because it's a page long. Catherine the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, George Washington, William Shakespeare, Queen Elizabeth II, FDR, Winston Churchill, Harriet Tubman, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, the Wright brothers, Charles Darwin, Leonardo da Vinci, Mozart, Beethoven, Giotto, Michelangelo, Henry V, Antoine Lavoisier, Gustav Mahler, Edmund Hillary, Teddy Roosevelt, Copernicus, Nikola Tesla, and Galileo were all members of the secret society meant to protect the secrecy of Cybertronians. And we are not even at the worst crime committed by this scene. Because they decide to show photographic and artistic proof of the Transformers throughout history. If it was just the Cybertronian Knights, I would understand. But it's not. Remember how Optimus Prime landed on Earth and said that they learned all the languages through the internet and they just got here and that Earth is a completely unknown planet? You only have to watch half the first movie to understand that very basic concept of the lore. Nope, that's not the case at all. Optimus Prime fought with Redcoats in 1815. I am gonna say that again. I'm gonna get closer. The Optimus Prime fought with the Redcoats in 1815. In addition to that, Ironhide was involved with the Redoubtable at Trafalgar. He pulled the ship to shore after it was destroyed. Hound fought in the American Revolution. And by the way, all three of these robots have their vehicle modes from modern day. Optimus is a semi-truck, Ironhide is a GMC, and Hound is very clearly an army vehicle. Drift was a literal samurai, and somewhere in Anthony Hopkins' study there is a poster that has a silhouette of the promotional image of Shockwave on it from Dark of the Moon. In addition to all of this, there are war propaganda posters featuring Hound and Bumblebee trying to get people to join the military. Wow, really fucking secret. Bumblebee and Hot Rod were both on the Devil's Brigade in World War II and killed Nazis. Now as stupid as that is, given the canon of this very franchise, I would unironically pay fantastic money to go see a movie called Bumblebee Nazi Hunter because that shit would probably go hard as hell. And you know what? I can't even find myself being that pissed over this scene because at least for once in this movie, they decide to show us something instead of telling us something. But because this movie can't do anything right, the whole scene is only 18 seconds because why would we put action in our action movie? You know what? No, fuck it. I'm done. I'm not doing this.